my name is Rich McCabe. I'm a project manager at the Software Productivity Consortium in the area of reuse. It's my pleasure today to introduce Casey King, a project manager at Boeing, who is currently in charge of the STARS Navy demonstration project uh, down in Orlando. Casey's here to tell uh, about the progress they've made on this uh, project and uh, to show how they're uh, approaching reuse in this particular uh, situation. Thank you. Casey? Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, STARS is, a, uh, is a, a program to create a paradigm shift in the way we do software, to reinvent the whole process, to try and uh, make it an order of magnitude uh, faster, better, and cheaper. Uh, uh, Boeing as, as a STARS Prime contractor and the Navy as one of the uh, cooperating uh, services uh, with the, the ARPA STARS program uh, looked at two things. One, they, they, they looked at a process that, that embodied the, the, the STARS reuse vision. Uh, and we looked one that not only embodied the reuse vision, but also uh, its vision for process improvement. And the, the Navy and Boeing uh, uh, found that the synthesis process answered the mail in both of those areas. Um, uh, the second thing we look for uh, in the Navy is uh, a, a project that we could demonstrate the benefits of uh, the STARS vision as implemented in the, uh, the synthesis uh, uh, process. And, uh, and we found that uh, aviation training vehicle systems, or what we call uh, ABTS, uh, was a particularly ripe candidate uh, in terms of the maturity of the domain, uh, the lack of risk involved in buying these, and we thought it's really time to, to apply these benefits from uh, the STARS and Synthesis Vision uh, to this particular marketplace. Uh, so the Navy designated uh, that family of air vehicle training systems uh, in general and in particular picked something called the T-34, which is the, the plane that the you know, Navy pilots learn in. Uh, a, 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 right, there you go, a flight uh, training system for, uh, for the T-34. Uh, particularly oriented around uh, teaching instrument pilots how to, to fly instruments. And uh, in, in, in putting this project together, we decided to do it in, in several phases uh, because basically this was a new process for us. And, and we anticipated some risks, uh, not only in the technology of training systems, but in the, in, in the organizations involved learning this process. So in, in, as a result of this, we put together a, a, a pilot project that was designed specifically to touch every one of the processes within the synthesis. And we go through the process, we produce the work products, we kind of figure out how we did that, and, and then we'd apply it in a broader area. In order to do that in a timely fashion, what we had to do was to reduce the kind of engineering burden uh, on this so we could do it in a relatively short period of time and mostly touch the processes. So we took this, this whole family of flight training systems uh, and we narrowed it down to something we called, uh, uh, at first we narrowed it down to a sliver, which was sort of the, the navigation communications uh, part of a training system. Uh, and then we narrowed it down even to a, uh, a finer area, which uh, was trying to, to, to do the training systems aspect of a uh, radio navigation aid, primarily TACAN and VOR. So, so what we want to do is kind of capture the commonality across the family of all TACANs and VORs, which are pretty common anyway. Uh, not a whole lot of variation as you go from one aircraft to another or one training system to another. They basically have the problem of trying to say there's a, a, a radio emitter on the ground and as, a, as an airplane flies uh, uh, around, it, it, it should have a little needle that points back to that radio station. And uh, if you're lucky, it'll give you not just only the bearing to that, but the range as well. So we wanted to simulate that behavior in a little piece of the training system. So that was our kind of pilot activity for what, in fact, is this demonstration project. Uh, we went through all the processes. What I'm about to show you are sort of the evidence, the tracks uh, that we laid down as we went through this process and give you some understanding of uh, what lessons we learned as we touched each of these processes and produced each of these work products. 
and some of the things that we'll be incorporating in our next iteration, which will cover a much, much broader area. So what the context again, this is the STARS uh, demonstration project. STARS is a software technology for adaptable or reliable systems. Uh, been around for a good number of years as an ARPA program. Uh, it's on, in its own end game now as a demonstration project. Each of the services is paired with one of the STARS Prime. We're paired, Boeing is paired with the Navy. And we pick this training systems world and we're focusing in on uh, the radio navigation aids and specifically TACAN and VOR. Now, we set this up, uh, uh, set ourselves up with some success criteria before we went into our pilot project so we could actually get measured as to whether we succeeded. We did this all last July, July of uh, uh, 93 and had our review in uh, January of 94 and we checked ourselves off against, and our management checked us off against these success criteria. We had two categories of success criteria. We had some explicit ones, which were the sort of the technology oriented, and some implicit ones, which turned out to be all of the management. And of course, we had the challenges that we think we uh, understood in the process of doing this. Uh, and a lot of aspects of, you know, did we, did we have a lessons learned process? We were doing this just to learn lessons, so we had to have a lessons learned process in place before we started it and had to make sure it worked, and it did. Uh, of course, synthesis is a, is a highly well-defined uh, process with well-defined work products, so we needed to check off, did we, in fact, uh, create all of those work products? Uh, the, the ultimate end of the whole process is, did you produce yet another process that application engineers could use? Uh, by the way, we probably spent about 98% of our time in domain engineering and 2% in application engineering. Uh, for this radio nav aids. Interesting kind of pie chart. Uh, <clears throat> were the processes followed as evidenced by did we, uh, did we meet all of the exit criteria uh, as we got out and did we meet the, uh, we had mixed bags on there and we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, probably around a hundred significant lessons were documented as a result of this. Uh, and in the end, did we produce a working system? Uh, did we, uh, we ran out of time and we, we finished, the, finished the pilot, so we did meet our time and, and budget. Uh, metrics were a challenge. Uh, we didn't uh, have what you would call a strong metrics process uh, throughout this. It developed as we went through, but we did collect basic effort, schedule cost. Uh, again, the, the object here was not as this as a predictor of what the effort would be, but just as a learn the process. So our, our emphasis, we're not on this. We did do a lot of guideline and detailed process and methods development during this process. And that was essentially one of the questions going in is what did you need to decide on and establish? And in fact, uh, this, this next chart over here, our document tree, Reuse Driven Software Process Guidebook, it's this. We found we had to develop methods and standards and practices and procedures. And if you get a chance, you might want to take a look at this as representative of the beginning of a tree that we anticipate will grow as we evolve the domain. Uh, we didn't have a clear view of what these were going to be going in, but we have a much clearer view now, I think. Uh, just to, to finish off the success criteria, uh, a lot of emphasis here, here on, on teaming. Uh, we took a multidisciplinary approach. We had domain experts and process engineers and environment engineers and the challenges of building and working a team that communicated. Uh, it was the same in our areas as it is for anybody else. Uh, I think Catherine's point of having to be a level three organization to underscore that several times. We tried hard to, be, to, to pretend we were one. Uh, so all of these implicit criteria kind of dealt with some of those side management issues. And, and teaming is at, at the core of all of those. Uh, this just shows two views. This probably a very high level view uh, of the, uh, the synthesis process. One of the challenges we found is in working with 
with engineers that were brought on the project without the full advantage of, of studying and rubbing themselves on the synthesis is that just understanding the two life cycle strategy was a was an essential element and a very difficult element of doing business a new way. It's almost once you can get the light turned on that says, aha, I understand how that's going to work, and I can visualize how it's going to change the way I do business, you can get participation. Uh, that, that's almost a top level, uh, very counterintuitive behavior in this kind of marketplace where you classically have fixed price throw it over the wall, money goes over the wall one way, a trainer comes back the other way, and, uh, and they're very expensive. So, so here's, the, here's the process. We went through all of these steps. As I said, we spent 98% of our time in domain engineering and 2% over here because the size of the application and the amount of leverage we were able to achieve and the automation we applied to it just said this now becomes a very fast process. That, by the way, if, if anything proves the concept of, of, of underlying two life cycles and synthesis and the whole mega programming paradigm for ARPA, that proves that you can spend, you know, if you plan up front and invest, okay, you're going to get return relative to that investment. Now the question is, that, and we won't answer, we didn't answer it on this iteration, and our whole demonstration project is supposed to answer, and the question is, is the investment here going to generate return? You do enough of them, you do them fast enough to have a business case. Uh, so w one of the other things I think that is, uh, we, like, like, like good engineers, uh, we sort of blinked at, at, at the management process and said this domain evolution stuff, we'll get to that later, that's not really important. That's really where we missed having the vision of the two life cycle and had confusion as we went down the path by engineers themselves of not fully understanding where this stuff was leading to. Uh, had we done some better domain planning, even for a pilot, so our lesson learned was uh, don't go past this. Uh, it's, it's an essential element. Or, or it's not just for your own strategic selling, but to, to get a shared vision of why you're doing some of these things very differently than you're used to. Uh, but one of the contrasts is you see this complex uh, pattern. This is kind of this synthesis process taken down a couple of levels of detail and put in a network. It is, uh, one could say, horrendously complex. Another could say typical projects, you know, look like this. The whole process, if you can stay with me on this, what we're trying to do is change each trainer development from this into way, way over here, something that kind of looks like falling off a log, a simple, trivial process to develop a component of a trainer, a whole trainer, whatever the case may be. So all the way from that level of complexity to that level of simpl uh, simplicity is, is you know, kind of one of the true, as we reflected back, what did we really do? Essentially, that's what we wound up doing. Uh, I'm going to, and now one of the things you'll see on this wall is, is we've got kind of a top slide that said this is what we did and some of the key lessons learned. We have what we think is a hope is an example of it. And then the work product that we actually used or, or generated uh, on our, our demonstration pilot is at the bottom. So that's a, uh, as we go through the thread here. There's one other thread, and, and this is probably one of the key things that we wanted to illustrate is having done this, we then went back and looked at, let's pick a small piece of the, even the stuff that we did and, and look at the notion of commonality, which we've represented in blue, and variability, which we've represented in red. So that's the key. And how this commonality and variability, which synthesis tells us, is the heart of a domain engineering effort, okay, how this shows up in the various work products, its relationship to each other, and there is a relationship, uh, which areas are kind of variability intensive, which ones are commonality intensive, uh, and, and just generally understanding how that rolls. So that's, that as we go through this, I'll try and pick up where this thread uh, uh, is illustrated. So 
We, we've kind of divided it for the sake of presentation as domain analysis, as you know, is the top level process and domain implementation. We, we kind of put a little seam in here just for illustrating that uh, design, which is really under the domain analysis, is we kind of considered that uh, representationally as a, a, a second part here. Um, it helped us understand that, I think, a little bit better. But one of the things we found, for example, let's start up in the beginning of domain analysis, is domain definition. The guidebook kind of suggested in its incremental uh, risk-averse strategy of do a little bit and then for a while and then go back. We found that in this iteration, it really made sense to, to have very fine-grained uh, variability assumptions and commonality assumptions and to keep a record of those domain expert assertions. This is where this and, and later in, in the decision model, but primarily in the, the variability assumptions, is where you separate the domain experts from the fakers, uh, from those that say, say they can but can't. Uh, we had some experience going back very early in this project is is this is where you put a blank piece of paper in front of somebody and people who are qualified domain experts can fill out that piece of paper, can understand, they understand their field with enough depth and richness, uh, they, under, they have the experience of multiple projects, they have the experience that knows how to analyze that experience and, and abstract what, was this, what they saw are patterns and what they saw as threads of commonality. And uh, we are, one of the results of this, we have a domain engineering or domain expert profile that we are continuously upping the ante on. You know, it started out with a master's degree and, and six years of experience and three systems and kind of inching up to four and six uh, 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 systems. Uh, we're almost insisting now that people have published something which demonstrates an ability to abstract and a passion to communicate and, and to think about, you know, that uh, trying to find the right level of horsepower, commitment, talent, experience. So if we learned anything here, and, and it showed up right in the beginning of the process, um, the talent for de making these assumptions that characterize the system is where the, you really, the, the, you know, if they can't get past this, don't let them because they're probably not going to contribute later down the line. They're not going to be the, have the kind of insights in domain engineering that you can go out and sell to application engineers. Uh, even if you, if you say, I have a policy, you will do domain engineering and you will do application engineering, if the quality of the domain engineering is not the, the kind that would be produced from your real water walkers, you're probably not going to get application projects to buy it. So this whole notion of domain engineering takes scarce resources and, and leverages them really comes out in this particular area. We found that um, to be the case. And we had some areas where we were very successful. It's not that, that nobody could do it. It just it, it depended upon the the depth and, and skill of the individual. Deep, skilled individuals were successful to satisfy the results. The, the assertions they put down in the beginning lasted through the duration. Those that weren't uh, just never got there. Uh, so essentially, your domain expert, this is really where you milk them dry because everything else, if you say this is a definitive, fine-grained statement of variability, uh, sure, you'll miss some things and you get some things a little bit wrong through all the subsequent tests, but the real invention and creativity part comes here. Uh, we went on from there to the decision model. Um, basically, the decision model which formalizes those assumptions, uh, that's really the heart of this process. Uh, and uh, we kept going back to it. Uh, uh, throughout the whole domain engineering cycle and even referred to it to understand the application engineering cycle. So we think it c becomes a, you know, sort of a baseline, a durable work product that a lot of people are going to uh, uh, reference. It's also where you find out if you've got the kind of predictable, definable variability that says I can get leverage. 
If you ask the hard questions up here, and you get real soft, fuzzy answers like, gee, I don't know how that varies. I know it varies, but I don't know how. The likelihood of getting real high leverage mechanistic reuse is probably going to be low. Uh, we, we, we kind of wired this thing because we thought we could really nail this TACAN and VOR, so we, didn't, we kind of factored out that problem. But in some areas, we looked like, like propulsion in, in training systems. That's kind of a non-deterministic solution. I mean, that engine works how like that, feels like that engine does feel, rather than by any definable parameters. So, so you may have, even within a given family, you may have areas that are well-behaved and lend themselves to mechanistic development, and others that you can kind of cauterize and say, put your code in here. <laughs> we, can't, we can't interpret it. Uh, so anyway, decision model, uh, the heart of what we did, um, as we said, the, the, the expertise and insight, uh, first evidence in the, the variability assumptions, it was really reinforced here that you could definitize how this variable behaved, what all the values were for this assertion. Uh, and, and of course, you want to work on this in, in nice little uh, bite-sized chunks. You want to package your, your decision modeling effort so that you can validate and verify little bits and pieces of it at a time. Because uh, where, where you come up with the wrong answer, then you've got to go back and refine your assumptions. So we worked a lot of these in, in, in a loop, in, in a tight loop. Um, so again, saying that that was a key area, once you've got this finished, you, I, I would not want to say this, but your reliance on domain expertise, what you can milk out of them, uh, cuts down, doesn't go away, because there are other things they help you with in, in other stages, but the, that basic insight of understanding variability, you've now got it bottled uh, if you finish that. Uh, uh, product requirements, I, I guess if there were uh, uh, one area that, that we felt was, was kind of we had the easiest time communicating. It was the least difficult for people schooled in traditional development. It was in the, the product. So we just said, list all your product requirements, and some of them are going to be conditional. So you got a whole bunch of nested if statements uh, in here. And, and, and we had a relatively easy time of relating to that, at least at the level that we test it. So, so product requirements, uh, uh, of all the phases, we kind of went over that the quickest, and we think we still did the right thing. Um, process requirements, uh, we were looking at a very small piece of this, so this was not a, a, a major area that we had an opportunity to, to learn. Uh, essentially, what we use this to do is to take the decision model and kind of say, what's the, the right sequence uh, to ask these questions, what's the right sequence uh, to walk down through what is essentially a tree and cut off, prune off various branches as you go, as you go through. Since we were starting with a very small branch uh, of this TACAN variability, uh, we, we, we still have a lot to learn about this, but uh, that seemed to be the right thing. Some other things that probably ought to be begin to understood at process requirements is, is some of the, what's later called the presentation paradigm. You know, how do people actually build this and where does the data come, come from and in what sequence are you likely to get it? Uh, it's one thing to say what kind of instruments are going to be in a given trainer or, or check that off. You know where the, that comes from. But, but uh, any kind of delay or dynamics in how needles move Maybe a whole nother data collection effort, maybe a whole nother process that tags along behind that your basic decision grouping that you established up here may not, may not give you visibility into. You just may not have the data at that time. Uh, so so there, there may need some other demands of process requirements that we haven't fully understood yet. Uh, all right, essentially, so everything we've done up to now that we've called domain analysis uh, ha has given us a good rich set of, of requirements. We've almost been able to, to put our domain experts on a part-time basis. They'll, they'll show up again when they 
detail, particularly process requirements, but we milk them dry for variability assertions and, and definitize those and sequence them uh, in the beginning part of the uh, domain analysis. Uh, the next part, product design, uh, has three major components that we, we considered. Architecture, uh, component design, uh, and generation design. Um, we were very fortunate on our project uh, to have what uh, we viewed as a very durable architecture, one that uh, part of the team, Boeing in particular, uh, had a lot of experience. In fact, we built it for the Air Force uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, and it was essentially, uh, uh, as architectures go, it was okay and very conventional, not very flashy. Uh, and it kind of packaged all of the uh, uh, functions of a flight training system into some very conventional, functional parts. So it was a functional architecture. Uh, we had all of the elements of flight station. Uh, visual systems were a sec separate architecture element. Physical cues, which in trainers are kind of the motion base that gives the feeling that you're, uh, that you're moving. Uh, propulsion uh, simulates the effects of the engine. The navigation communications piece does radios and radio navigation aids. That's the part that we had this little slice. So this gives you a kind of a feel of, of what, so we did a, a piece of that, maybe, maybe about 20% of what would eventually be in a total uh, of this. And this is one of the smaller pieces of the total architecture. So we had this architecture going in, a little bit cheating, so we didn't have to build our own architecture. But one of the things that happened on this is uh, uh, we wound up validating that this was a good architecture, not only for training systems as an abstraction, but it was also a process-friendly architecture. And that became a much more important consideration because uh, what we were able to do is to divide the work up, the work packages that we were going to work on for the rest of domain engineering into process-friendly pieces that you could have definable skills and a rational set a team to work on those. Now, granted, for the pilot, we only had one, so, but a as it developed, it, be it became clear that that was going to be important when we tackled the, the full scope of this. Uh, we actually developed a subset of this architecture uh, for this, uh, what we call the slice um, of the demonstration, and wound up breaking it down into uh, specific pieces. And, and here, here you see navigation communications, uh, you see TACAN controls, and this TACAN determined self-test, which in fact is what all of these strings, this string goes for a set of commonality that says there is always going to be some self-test, or probably if there is a self-test procedure, it's going to be in a package called that. And the variability, just to recover back here, that we've established, it says one of the ways that you can, that self-test can vary if you have self-test, is the effect of the push and hold button, or when you push the self-test button, excuse me, uh, does it self-test cycle uh, just by pushing it, or does it self-test cycle as long as you hold it? One of the uh, variability factors in how self-test initiation works. So we made an assertion about that. We kind of definitized that as uh, in our decision model. Uh, we put some conditional requirements against the product that, you know, if that were a characteristic, then it had to do this. We said, uh, uh, for the process requirements to build one of these things, you better ask that question, and you better ask it after you've asked some other questions at a higher level. And then finally put it in an architectural context that says, here's a block of the, the in system where that's going to fit. So that just picks that up. And that's the commonality, and the, the red is the variability. Uh, coming down from architecture, uh, and, and very closely related to this was uh, the domain engineering notion of component design. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, one of the reactions in experience bases uh, were that um, um, people weren't clear where architecture left off and component began. Uh, so in some cases, people would say, boy, that's a, I thought architecture and the word high level were synonymous. Uh, but in fact, we're finding architecture can be as detailed as you need it to be, or as it should be. Uh, and, uh, and that design, you know, uh, making trade decisions, if you will, uh, probably happened at a much lower level. So there's a lot of looping back and forth. One of the other things that, 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 that became apparent here, and this is just a, a perception as a result of learning this, this, uh, this lesson. You look at this component design, if you were to come up close and look at this, you'd see uh, a lot of if statements. Kind of looks like pseudocode describing if it's push and hold, do this, else, if it's this, do something else. That sounds like kind of process stuff. Uh, so we're finding that not only were the lines between design and architecture blurred, the lines between process and product became blurred and helping our product domain engineers understand that they weren't designing a product in the classic sense, but designing something that had the seeds of process wrapped inside it okay, as well as around it, uh, what was a, a significant learning uh, challenge and experience once they'd, they'd overcome that. And we'll, we'll see that uh, happen in several areas down here. Uh, so, so we had component design. Now the, the one area that is almost pure process is this uh, generation design. You know, up till now, component and architecture sounds like pretty ho-hum vanilla. Uh, software development, so we, when you add generation design, then you throw the, 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 the traditional mindset for a real loop. Uh, <coughs> and, and one of the things that, that is incorporated under generation design is, is something that is, has always been a challenge in software and systems engineering, which is to keep mapping between your requirements and solution world. Uh, but also, we, you know, we've added to that the complexity of mapping variability in both requirements and variability in solutions. So this triple set of mappings, uh, architectural and component mapping being maybe product or component or commonality intensive, and the decision mapping, which is kind of variability intensive, locks in, in addition to the problem solution mapping, locks in variability. Uh, we found this to be an extremely effective treatment. Uh, we, we, uh, we had some good people on the project who, who understood it a lot sooner than some of the rest of us uh, did. And uh, we were very happy to this rationalized a lot of the loose ends that had been flapping for us uh, in earlier products because it brought uh, commonality, variability, uh, requirements, and design into one tractable, complex but tractable piece. So this was a, we spent a lot of time looking at this, building kind of our own record keeping system to, to treat this uh, and, and, and capture this mapping. Uh, this seemed to be a very effective mechanism uh, for us and, and embodied a lot of, of what we were trying to achieve. So uh, commend that you look very carefully at these and put a lot of emphasis uh, on them. Okay, so up until now, we've, we've, we've gone through our requirements analysis. We've, we've turned the corner and, and, and gotten a design that didn't look anything like the requirements, which is a, a test of a good design and complex system. Uh, we, we followed, kept the variability commonality thread. We've had the product process uh, differentiation, and we, we've you know, been able to figure out how much they interact with each other and how they are different. Now we're ready to do serious uh, development uh, in the implementation phase. And uh, although they're, they're indicated as separate uh, component and, and generation procedures, and we actually had two teams, 
We said, oh, there are two processes. There's a component process and a generation process. We'll have two teams go off and do this. Uh, they, they wound up sitting in each other's lap, not able to you know, go from hour to hour, let alone day to day or week to week, uh, working separately. A lot of interaction. Uh, that's probably one of the areas we're going to have to rethink and work a little bit is how we organize for that because having those, uh, maybe having a process, somebody with process skills on a team, uh, uh, we're, we're not quite sure how we're going to do this, but w we probably didn't organize ourselves, organize ourselves correctly. Uh, this is the area where our, uh, one of our team members, that is Boeing's team member on the STARS, project to put something out there that'll be the beginning of hopefully a, a healthy market of software engineering environments for mega programming and synthesis uh, digital equipment corporation uh, uh, has been supplying platforms and and some of their common data dictionary repository based products uh, Boeing uh, team in Seattle has been working hard to add value to to put in the notion of, of how to represent this stuff uh, this is the area where we started to use that very extensively. Uh, we did some use of this earlier, but, but some of the key things you're going to see is basically broke this process down into how we loaded the C up with these uh, implemented uh, components and generators, or this you know, mixture of components and generators, so that then somebody could do application engineering uh, down the line here. Uh, and essentially, uh, we kind of cast this w using some of the information that came in our process requirements uh, and were designed into the generation procedure to say, essentially, we visualize that an application engineer, when they sit down to build one of these TACANs of the future, uh, will sit down and answer a set of questions. Now, the fact that they're not going to build a TACAN as an end product that means that they've answered a whole bunch of other questions beforehand uh, and put it in the context of a training system and, and the family and, and named what this training system is. So that the heart of the, this whole results of the implementation for us was this, what we call a decide screen. Uh, now, uh, the decide screen uh, is something generated by CAMEL which is, Maggie, what's CAMEL stand for? Knowledge-Based Application Modeling Evaluation Tool. Otherwise known as CAMEL. One humps or two. Uh, one for process, one for product. Uh, so, so CAMEL is, is the function that we've put into our software engineering environment that essentially takes that decision model as it has been adapted by the generation uh, design and the component design uh, and poses the right questions in the right form at the right time in the right sequence with all the right validation and verification underneath it uh, to help capture the variability for an instance. So domain engineers build something that will generate a camel screen, which is a lot of CLIPS, which stands for C language inference processor. Yes. Okay. Which is a NASA public domain tool, by the way. Uh, and so Camel sits on top of Clips and asks you a bunch of questions. A lot of engineering goes on underneath this, but for this stage, uh, that's essentially the, the, the model. So, so this defines what the screen looks like. The output of the screen takes the answers to that question and then builds a, uh, a retrieve function. This is kind of like an adaptable process that is then uh, executed and uh, uh, split into a retrieve function and then you get some uh, the values by themselves which are used by that retrieve function, the values coming from the uh, the decide screen and together these values and the retrieve function go get some adaptable code. This is the closest thing that we have in our system to a component, what people would like to think of a component. But if you take a look at this in detail, one of the things you'll see is a lot of process statements embedded in here of if one of the values that you got on this screen is this value, throw out this code, <laughs> change this value, 
Uh, that's what all of this camel retrieve adaptable code package tends to do. It's part of the process. Uh, so one of the things you look at this and, and say that uh, uh, some of these things where there are a lot of variability dots are kind of the process intensive parts of the process and the ones with the, the, the blue pins and threads that are product are the product intensive parts of the process. The whole thing together in fact comes out the end as a process. This was another key learning element is everybody, we had people writing adaptable code who thought they were doing traditional ADA coding for traditional components and found, found in fact that they had to think of the process. They had to think of the process of being adaptable. Developing that awareness and appreciation was perhaps one of the more frustrating uh, elements of and, and kind of threw them off stride into some coding practices that weren't particularly good, stressed people whose coding capability was not strong to begin with, got real stressed and, and, and almost fell off the log. So we had, had a lot of coaching in here. Uh, and and as, as we go through this another time, we know we're going to have to do a lot of training and coaching in understanding the, the nature of adaptable code and why and how it's different from regular code. Uh, at least in this particular version. And so through a combination of ROMs is our reusable object access method uh, management system, excuse me, man. Uh, and it's where all of this stuff kind of resides across the whole family, logically. There's sort of one repository. It's the repository piece of this. Uh, I think an interesting feature that we found in this, particularly looking at other reuse strategies, uh, other reuse strategies emphasize uh, reuse librarianship and the notion of browsing and like to keep metrics about hit ratios. Essentially what our process, our mechanistic process does is uh, every time we go to the library we get a hit because we went there because a process said go there and go find exactly one and only one product, pick it out, adapt it, you know, in, in predictable ways and uh, send it to me. So, so some of the, the metaphors that are used in the reuse community such as browsing and searching and candidate components, and this is really the heart of leveraged reuse. You know, this is where leverage says every time I go to the library, I get something because I wouldn't have gone there if I wasn't going to get it. Simple, straightforward. Probably makes it more investment intensive and your investment has to be a little smarter than it otherwise would be. But that's real, the real payback. You don't spend, waste a lot of time looking at things you're not going to use. Uh, and so that gives us to adapted code. Uh, and, and all the, the, the things, Everything up to this point on the top, these are files that, that these processes use, uh, and this is a screen that is generated. All of this code, the make function, the retrieve function, and the adaptable code is all in, in, in ROMs to begin with before you do the first amount of application engineering. Uh, the things that, that are created as a result of exercising this process are this decision vector and the generator retrieve file uh, and of course the adapted code. So, so these are the points that, that are transient for this particular system. The rest of this is part of the furniture for the family. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 the process definition for doing all of this that we, we anticipated was that. Uh, the amount of time it took to, to actually execute this was actually in the order of an embarrassing few minutes. <laughs> uh, setting up some of the context of the higher level questions that had nothing to do with radio nav aids. But the radio nav aid part of this, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, that was the payoff for the in this, this several months of investment. Uh, Clearly, we need to get smarter about doing the front part of this domain engineering so that, that there's a little less of that ratio. 
But I think we proved to ourselves and to our community that if we spent the time to get this under control, we in fact could take this complex spaghetti bowl of a project and reduce it to the simplicity of a well-behaved, repeatable, defined, optimizable process. Uh, are there any questions? What happened uh, in the future that you have more variability than what you planned in your process? We actually, got, we actually had on this more variability than we had planned. It, it got more complex. Uh, um, just the, the, the variety of ways, particularly when you're simulating faults uh, and, 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 and training conditions, the number of different ways that some of the, even the simplest instruments can behave um, is, uh, that's a challenge. We're not sure what the total number will be and whether it will pass over the end. But it, it did lend itself to, we could define, you know, when we found some people, at least based on their expertise, you can pretty well definitize how these things vary. I mean, the, the people who are expert know there are only three manufacturers of TACAN. And if there's ever another one, I'll know about it three years before we have to worry about it, you know. Um, some of our other experiences that were not part of this pilot, but an earlier trial use, as I said, looked at, at some of the propulsion areas and said, there's this big box and I, have, I, I cannot give you a deterministic, mechanistic way to solve that, but I can bound it for you, which is almost as good as where you lose is if you assert there's definitive variability and there isn't. Then it's surprise time. Okay, if you assert that there is boundable variability, you're still ahead. If your variability is not definable or boundable, those are domains you don't want to do any investment at all in. And they're probably not good candidates for this high leverage uh, synthesis approach. Yeah, Rich. The question, I'm not sure, uh, I may put words in his mouth here, but I'll ask the question anyway, uh, had to do maybe with what happens when you do a variability analysis of early on and then you get it wrong the first time and you get down in the implementation and go oh my gosh I've got some other variables here uh, I haven't taken an account for uh, yet I've got to file an engineering change request or something and go back and expand my domain or do something like that did you have that uh, experience well you know one of one of the things that we had done uh, we actually did two iterations uh, you know I, I thought it was hard enough to describe one iteration <laughs> rather than two. We actually did this in two iterations in which we kind of got uh, to about here. <laughs> and we learned a whole bunch of lessons, such as, whoops, there's more variability in here, or there's different variability, or some of our assumptions. So we jumped back, reset the clock, and, and started over here. And we actually even planned to do that. So, so in the, the overall process, there were two iterations. And that was kind of how. Uh, the other thing we did that may be challenging, and we're looking to our software engineering environment and its underlying information model to accommodate, is to help us with that. Because you're right, once we get into some of these design, we'll get some surprises. Uh, so part of the challenge on the management side is that you were doing incremental evolutionary development yep. even in the pilot uh, project. And, and of course one of the learning things is, is we, we didn't see a whole lot of benefit and maybe it was just the people and the perspective but it, it seemed to make sense. We, we, we kept these assumptions, we want to make these assumptions real definitive. Uh, so we looped between decision model and, and assumptions. Just like we loop between design and architecture, or de design and architecture. So, so we got to some pairs of processes where we kind of throw the configuration management blanket around the pair, uh, where there was particular trade-off between discovery and formal formalizing, which is really what that decision model is, is a formalizing your insights. So it seemed like going back and forth between these Pairwise uh, was was a good strategy at the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hello, I'm Jerry Turner. I'm a software engineer with Rockwell. Three years ago, Rockwell's Command and Control Systems Division in Richardson, Texas, established an internal research and development project to investigate software reuse. This project became a synthesis pilot for the Software Productivity Consortium. The objective of the project is to institute a reuse-driven software development process for Rockwell's Command and Control Systems Division. This would result in timely, lower-cost development of high-quality, reliable software. In this segment, I will discuss our experience with synthesis and show examples of synthesis work products. Because the work is proprietary, only segments of products will be shown. We have developed three domains at Rockwell CCSD. The first domain was a communications management and control domain. The second domain was the MIL standard 1553B communication domain, which is a subdomain of the communication management and control domain. Our current domain is a message handling system domain. Before we started synthesis, we realized it was essential to establish a foundation of disciplined methods and automated tools. Disciplined software development methods incorporated into the domain development process allowed us to produce reusable work products. Weekly product reviews enhance communication between domain engineers. Tools were used to support the adopted software development methods, to adapt components, and to produce an interactive application engineering environment. The methods used were real-time structured analysis, a requirements method by Ward and Miller, ADARTS, a design method by the Software Productivity Consortium, and departmental coding and documentation standards. We modified the ADARTS development process to incorporate work products created because we were using synthesis and because we must capture variations. I borrowed this picture of the ADARTS development process and modified it to show the incorporation of synthesis. You can see as domain engineers, we began our software development process with domain analysis. Domain analysis is done prior to other activities and iterations are made to the domain analysis work products throughout the process. Our experience showed that as we progressed through the process, the decision model changed the most. The other domain analysis work products seemed to stabilize. Our engineers needed a way to manage the changes in the decision model. We added to our synthesis work products a graphical representation of the decision model that can be maintained with available automated tools. We also added work products to capture variations. Next I will show segments of work products. The synopsis allowed our domain engineers to set a boundary around a domain and identify systems that were in the domain and systems that were not in the domain. This segment of a synopsis specifies the systems that are in the MIL standard 1553B subdomain. Notice bus controllers, remote terminals, and bus monitors are in the domain. The commonalities allowed our domain engineers to specify the requirements of every system in the domain. This example shows a commonality. Our domain engineers begin commonality statements with the word every to emphasize the concept that all systems in the domain must satisfy this requirement. The variabilities allowed our domain engineers to specify the requirements that may vary from system to system. This example shows how system requirements may vary. The decision model allowed our domain engineers to elaborate on the variations. This example shows an elaboration on the previous example. In this decision model segment, we show the variations, the specific decisions, and the mnemonic that will be used for adapting components. This is a segment from an adaptable document. We added a graphical representation of the decision model to our synthesis work products. This graphical representation is maintained with available tools and allows the domain engineer to manage the hierarchy of decisions. We captured variations in our requirements model by creating non-deliverable variation data flow diagrams. The deliverable products will have data flow diagrams on the levels below based on customer requirements. 
This is an example of a variation diagram. We captured variations in our design by showing common parts of the design and introducing overlays for the variation. This is an example of how we showed a design model with variations. We decided an interactive application engineering environment was the most attractive to our projects. This is a screen from an application engineering environment. This environment allows an application engineer to specify product requirements. The user interface allows the domain engineer to bound the current decisions and to add decisions as the domain evolves.